Welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're going to be discussing the fixed charge coverage ratio, a key credit stat. I don't know that there are 12 million definitions of this floating around online, but I've looked and there are definitely a lot of definitions and explanation articles, and a lot of them seem to contradict each other. So we're going to try to get to the bottom of this in this lesson and look at different ways to calculate this and what this metric means. If you want the files and resources, you can go to this URL on screen. It's on our financial statement analysis knowledge base page and fixed charge coverage ratio FCCR. I will pin this below the video as the first comment so you can click on it there as well. So let me give you the three minute version and then we'll look at different points here in a bit more detail and go through a few different Excel examples. At a high level, the fixed charge coverage ratio measures how easily a company can pay for the interest expense on its debt, the scheduled or mandatory debt principal repayments and the rental or lease payments based on its available cash flow after most other recurring spending. So that is a lot of words. And so I think it's helpful to just look at the definitions here so you can see how it's actually calculated. One definition online seems to be what I call the accounting based FCCR, which equals EBIT or operating income, plus the company's fixed charges, which normally include rental and lease payments, but could potentially include other things. We'll get into that a little bit later. And then you divide that by those same fixed charges plus the interest expense. So EBIT is before interest. And so this measures how well a company can cover the interest expense on its income statement with other line items on its income statement. Now, another way to do this is what I call the cash flow or cash flow based fixed charge coverage ratio, which equals EBITDA plus the rental or lease payments if applicable. Then you subtract capital expenditures and then you subtract cash taxes. And then you divide all that by a somewhat different measure of what a fixed charge is, cash interest, scheduled debt repayments, and then rent and lease payments, rent or lease payments, I should say. I put if applicable here, because as you'll see, depending on the accounting system used, you may not actually always add these back. So it's a little bit ambiguous. Let's go and look at a simple example in a simple LBO model. So I'm pulling up one of the examples we've used previously. This LBO model uses 5X debt to EBITDA for the company. It has 2% mandatory principal repayments of this initial $500 million principal, 10% interest rate, and a 50% cash flow sweep. So the model here is already set up, and you can see how we have free cash flow in each period. The company has these $10 million mandatory debt principal repayments in each period as well. And then with their cash flow available for debt repayment, they always use 50% to repay the debt balance, and so it falls significantly by the end. To calculate the fixed charge coverage ratio, based on the cash flow method, we start with EBITDA. So we go up to the income statement and get this. Now the rental or lease payments are not explicitly part of this model, so we'd need to get some information from the company on that, but they'll be part of the expenses here in between revenue and EBITDA for a company that follows US GAAP like this one does. So I've already filled these in based on some hard-coded numbers. Then we subtract capital expenditures, which should be on the cash flow statement. And then we subtract cash taxes. In this case, I'll just go up and link to the taxes on the income statement. If we had some adjustment for these, such as deferred taxes in the cash flow area, we'd factor that in so we get the actual cash taxes paid instead of just the book taxes paid. We can then add these up. I don't know what you call this metric exactly, but I'm just saying it's modified EBITDA. I don't know if there's really an official name, maybe available cash flow or something like that. And then for the fixed charges, we start with the cash interest expense. So I'll go up to the income statement to get this. We don't separate this into cash versus non-cash interest. So you can assume it's just all cash interest right here. Then we take the scheduled debt principal repayments and you have to be very careful because there are two types of repayments here the mandatory ones, and then the optional ones that come from the company's extra cash flow. We do not want the optional repayments. We only want the scheduled or mandatory repayments right here, the 2% of that initial debt principal. And then we also add back the rent or lease payments. We add these all up and this gives us our total fixed charges. And then we can say the fixed charge coverage ratio equals this modified EBITDA or available cash flow or whatever you want to call it divided by the fixed charges. We copy this across. And so we get to ratios here between the 1x and 2x range. So that is the basic idea for the fixed charge coverage ratio in the context of credit and LBO models like this one. Now, there are plenty of variations. Some people will completely ignore the rental or lease payments. Some people will argue that you should subtract common dividends. Maybe not in an LBO context, but in a standalone company context. 
If there are preferred dividends, because the company has preferred stock, those should also be counted as part of the fixed charges in the denominator. So you will see many variations. The basic principle is that the numerator should always reflect the available cash flow and the denominator should always reflect the fixed charges the company must pay regardless of its revenue, business activities, or the macro environment. So here, for example, if you look at the fixed charges, it doesn't matter what the company's revenue is or what its margins are like. It always owes that interest expense and it always has to pay the rent or lease expense here because it's already taken out a five or 10 year lease and those are already scheduled in advance. And the same goes for the debt principal repayments. By contrast, if you look at something like the operating expenses, potentially the company could change its number of employees or the spending on outside services it has, or it could try to adjust its cost of goods sold. So those can vary based on the overall business environment, but these fixed charges cannot. Generally speaking, the fixed charge coverage ratio should be above 1x, and ideally it should be more like 2 to 3x for the best companies, and you can see even higher numbers than that in some industries. So that's the short version. Let's now talk about what to know about this metric in more detail. First, we'll go through how to interpret the fixed charge coverage ratio in real life. Then we'll talk about the fixed charge coverage ratio versus the debt service coverage ratio versus leverage and coverage ratios. And then we'll talk about what's wrong with the fixed charge coverage ratio and some potential problems with this metric. So in real life, you normally use the fixed charge coverage ratio with other metrics like debt to EBITDA and EBITDA interest to determine a company's credit risk, borrowing limits, and the terms for its new debt. So for example, a company with a three to four X coverage ratio will probably pay less interest and have more favorable repayment terms than a company with one to two X coverage. Sometimes the FCCR is also part of the loan covenants. And so lenders may require a certain minimum level. And if a company falls below that minimum, let's say it's 1.5 X, then it might have to pay penalty fees or pay higher interest rates or be penalized in some other way. And in extreme cases, the lender could even call for immediate repayment of the debt if it gets bad enough. I'll bring up this example of Netflix. This is a refinancing model for Netflix and I've calculated the fixed charge coverage ratio for them. Their modified EBITDA is very healthy because they don't really have much in the way of fixed charges. Their rent or lease payments are quite minimal. Their CapEx is fairly minimal and their cash taxes are probably the most substantial thing here, but overall the company is operating in a pretty healthy way. We have a minimum FCCR of 1.5X and in this base case, they're at five to 10X. So they're well above any type of minimum here. If we change this to the extreme downside case and go back down and take a look at this, even in this extreme downside case, they're still pretty well covered. They do drop a little bit lower to the two to three X level in some of these years, but they're still far above the minimum. So our quick conclusion from a company like this is that even if the business does horribly and it actually shrinks year after year, they'll probably be fine because their debt and fixed costs are so low. In fact, I would argue that the main thing we might want to factor in or take into account here is that instead of counting CapEx as you would for a traditional company, for a company like Netflix, we might actually want to count something like the net amount that they're spending on content assets. And you could make a very reasonable case that that should actually be here in addition to CapEx or in place of CapEx. Now, if we look at the other company here, our simple LBO example, this one, the story is much more questionable because the ratio is much lower. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a lender would turn down this deal or not approve the deal, but they would dig into it more. The leverage is pretty high, 5X debt to EBITDA, and they're paying 8X EBITDA for the company as a whole. There are also a lot of risk factors because they're counting on some margin expansions and more of a capital light business, but that may or may not actually happen. The fixed charge coverage ratio helps us quantify this risk because it lets us say, let's say that margins are lower than expected. Well, then the coverage might fall by a certain percentage. And so then maybe we need a higher interest rate to compensate for that risk. So here, for example, let's say that things do not play out as expected. And let's say that maybe the EBITDA margin actually falls and maybe it goes down to 35%. In this case, the fixed charge coverage ratio starts at 1x and it only goes up to about 1.3x. So there isn't nearly as much improvement over time, which means there is more risk for the lenders, which means that they will probably try to impose higher interest rates or other terms that are more favorable for them. I wanna talk about a comparison between the FCCR and the DSCR and a few other ratios as well. So both the fixed charge coverage ratio and the debt service coverage ratio are based on the cash flow available for the interest ex expense plus scheduled debt repayments.
But the debt service coverage ratio is more of a project finance metric for credit analysis and debt sizing and sculpting. We've covered all these in previous tutorials. The DSCR ignores an asset's ability to pay for rent and lease payments in general. Now it does factor into the cash flow available for debt service, that component of the DSCR, but it's not in the denominator. The DSCR is strictly concerned with the debt and the interest expense and the scheduled principal repayments. It doesn't care about the rent or lease payments at all. The FCCR deducts all CapEx or most CapEx. The DSCR only deducts maintenance CapEx. And with working capital, only cash flow available for debt service used in the DSCR includes the change in working capital. Typically, this is not part of the fixed charge coverage ratio. So they are similar, but there are some differences in the nuances and the specific line items that go into these metrics. The leverage ratio is defined as debt to EBITDA, and then the interest coverage ratio is defined as EBITDA divided by the interest expense. There are variations where people can deduct CapEx, cash taxes, the change in working capital, et cetera. They can also use the net numbers for many of these. And going back to the Netflix model, you can see some examples here where we look at these metrics. We look at the leverage ratio, we look at the interest coverage ratio, and we'd use these in conjunction with the fixed charge coverage ratio to determine just how risky the company is and how much debt it should be borrowing. The basic trade-offs are that these EBITDA-based metrics are simpler to calculate, they're more widely agreed upon, and they're better for comparability and for looking at one company and seeing how it stacks up to its similar companies, its peer companies. But the cash flow-based metrics, like the fixed charge coverage ratio, as we're defining it, are better for determining what the company's true cash flow is and how well it could service its debt each year. So it's very similar to the difference between EBITDA and free cash flow, for example. So everything that we've been through, through so far might sound good, but there are some issues with the fixed charge coverage ratio that explain why you don't necessarily see it used quite as much in real life as you might think. The first problem is that there's a lot of conflicting information about, out there about the definitions and the items that are actually counted as fixed charges. I showed you one example here for Netflix where we're using the traditional definition for the available cash flow, but you could easily look at this company and make the argument that we should really be counting the content spending here, either in place of or in addition to CapEx. And that might be fine, but we'd have to footnote it and explain it and also explain why it doesn't match the traditional definition. Another issue is IFRS 16 lease accounting and how for IFRS based companies, you don't add the rent or lease payment in the numerator because of the fact that EBITDA already excludes the full rent or lease payment under that system. Now under US GAAP, you do still add it because EBITDA deducts the entire lease payment under US GAAP, but under IFRS you do not. And so you get these differences between different accounting systems as well. There's also this question of what to do with common dividends and distributions, because in some industries like equity REITs, they are effectively required in other industries like utilities or midstream companies in oil and gas, for example, they're not exactly required, but investors do expect them and they will punish companies that don't issue them. So you could go back and forth on this and people will treat these in different ways depending on the industry and company. So for all those reasons, the fixed charge coverage ratio seems like a great idea. And in some ways it is, but in practice, it tends to be messier to use. And we don't think it's quite as useful for comparison purposes as some of the simpler credit stats and ratios. So let's do a quick recap and summary now. How to interpret the fixed charge coverage ratio in real life. It tells you, generally speaking, how well a company can cover its mandatory debt service, interest expense, scheduled principal repayments, and its rent and lease payments that have already been locked in based on its available cash flow to do so. And you can calculate the available cash flow and the fixed charges in different ways, but you just have to be consistent and explain what you're doing when you show it to someone. You always want companies to be above 1x. It's even better if they're in the 2x, 3x, 4x, or even higher range. With this comparison, the FCCR and DSCR are similar in some ways, but the DSCR is more of a project finance metric. It treats CapEx somewhat differently. It treats the change of working capital differently. It doesn't care about the rent or lease payments at all. And then with the leverage and coverage ratios, they're just simpler and easier to calculate and better for comparative purposes, but they don't give you quite as accurate a picture of how much cash flow the company can actually use to service its debt. What's wrong with the fixed charge coverage ratio? Conflicting definitions, different treatments in different industries. IFRS 16 lease accounting complicates things quite a bit. There are also questions about what to do with common dividends and distributions, and these could vary based on the industry as well. So that's about it for this tutorial. 
Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this important credit metric and how you can use it in real life and also some of the drawbacks of using it in real life.